Hi everyone, thanks for attending uh, this Tsinghua University and uh, UCL joint seminar on the topic of low carbon and uh, a smart healthy buildings. Uh, my name is Rui Tang from UCL Institute for Environmental Design and uh, Engineering. Uh, I'm today's uh, moderator of this seminar. And today we will have uh, two uh, excellent talks given by Professor uh, Claire Hiversai from UCL IEDE and the Professor Bo Ronglin from Tsinghua University. Uh, during, the, uh, during the talk, so if you have any questions, you can put your question in the uh, chat of Zoom meeting. Uh, alternatively, you can uh, unmute yourself after the talk to spell your question out. And uh, Professor Claire and Professor Bo Ronglin uh, will answer your question. So let, let me move to our uh, fourth uh, speaker, uh, Professor Claire Hiversai. Um, the, talk, uh, the talk's title is Climate Change and Health uh, Temperature Impact on Health in Urban Settings. Um, Professor Claire Hiversai is an NERC Independent Research uh, Fellow and Associate Professor at UCL. Uh, her research is multidisciplinary and uh, covers climate change, uh, health impacts, uh, air pollution, and the urban climate. And Claire's background is in uh, meteorology and uh, atmospheric uh, physics, and she also worked in the public health sector for almost a decade, uh, becoming head of climate change at Public Health England in 2017. So I will hand over to uh, Professor Clive. And uh, Clive, it is your time for the, for the talk. Let me stop my share. Okay. okay, hopefully that worked. Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. we can see your screen. Great, thank you very much. Okay, just... So yes, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. So it's, um, it's very nice to be asked to, to give a talk with uh, lots of excellent uh, professors throughout the, the weeks of, of these uh, talks. So today my talk will be slightly at a, a larger spatial scale than some of the, the other talks in the series um, because I work more at the city scale. Um, so. Uh, so I'm going to talk about climate change and health um, and particularly I'm going to talk about temperature impacts and obviously I'm going to focus on the urban environment. So just to give you an outline of the talk today, so I'm going to talk uh, more generally first of all about climate change and health and give you a few examples and then I'm going to move on to uh, talk specifically about temperature effects on health because these are the um, these are the most direct ways in which climate change affects health and then I'm going to talk about um, sorry I just lost my I'm going to talk uh, specifically about the urban heat island and then I'll give you some current examples of research that we're, we're, we're currently working on. So just to start off with climate change and health. So climate change actually presents a major global health risk. Um, and I'm sure many of you are aware of some of the, the health risks from, from climate change. And I've taken this figure from a recent paper because it, it very nicely sets out the whole story. So if you can see from the top, we have the main drivers of climate change are increasing levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And that leads to um, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, and also extreme weather events. And these affect health in a number of different ways. So we would say that they are path there are many pathways in which climate change will affect health. So they might be very direct ways. So things like extreme weather events, if you imagine floods and droughts and storms, they can have a, a direct impact on health. And there's also the direct impact of heat stress. So that can be something as um, sort of less uh, serious. So it could be uh, reduced thermal comfort, but it can also exacerbate illness that people already uh, have. So uh, cardiovascular 
disease in particular is exacerbated by heat and it can lead to mortality. And then there are a number of pathways <clears throat> which are less direct. So climate change will affect things like air quality, water quality, food supply and food quality. And that obviously has um, health effects. Um, there's also the effect of the climate on vector distribution. So this is things like vector-borne diseases. So uh, mosquitoes are a, a good example of um, vectors which uh, spread diseases. And then there's, of course, the many different social factors which um, play out uh, to leading to many different uh, health impacts. And the health impacts themselves can range from um, fatalities from people killed by floods and, and so on, and then heats related uh, illness or mortality. But then there are also things like uh, respiratory cardiovascular disease, there's malnutrition, um, infectious disease, and very importantly, the mental health impacts of climate change, which are quite difficult to measure, but they are really um, very widespread. So, for example, if you can imagine a lot of environmental degradation leads to forced migration of populations and resource deficiencies, and all of these things can uh, lead to really serious uh, physical and mental health impacts. So I just want to highlight this uh, part of the diagram here. So in the past, we focused a lot on the exposure and we would look at how people are exposed to temperature and so on. But it, it's clearly um, more complicated than that. And the extent of the risk from climate change for any population depends on a range of demographic, socio-economic and environmental factors. So things like just geography, where you live, the kind of um, food uh, supply, baseline air and water quality where you live currently, the, the health system, uh, all of these things will affect um, cli how climate change affects health. So we're focusing more, um, more research effort in recent years to really understand all these different factors. And obviously different parts of the world will be affected in different ways from climate change, but it's safe to say that the parts of the world which are contributing most to carbon emissions are not the same parts of the world which are going to suffer from the worst health impacts. So if you scale by the size of the um, <clears throat> the size of the, the carbon emissions each country is giving, this is quite a different picture to the, um, the health impacts. So I'm going to focus mostly on temperature effects on health now. <clears throat> and I'm sure you've seen figures like this uh, quite frequently. So this shows the global average temperature change since pre-industrial times. So uh, this is since we started really seriously burning fossil fuels in uh, around 18, mid 1800s. So as you can see from this, uh, we are currently experiencing about one degree temperature increase compared with pre-industrial times. Um, but so this doesn't seem like that larger temperature change because after all we have uh, temperature changes of one degree happen very frequently. But obviously diagrams like this only show the global average temperature change and also the annual average temperature difference. So we have to uh, dig down a bit more um, to look at spatial differences and, and temporal differences in temperature. <clears throat> so if we look at a sort of spatial view of temperature change now, this is looking at the observed change in uh, surface temperature from 1900 to 2012. And you can see that although on average, we might see one degree temperature rise over this period, that actually a lot of the largest temperature changes have, have occurred over land areas, so the sort of more purple areas. So rather than one degree, these temperature changes might be around two and a half degrees. And obviously this is where most of the people live, so uh, this is why we are mostly interested in, in land areas in terms of health. <clears throat> but we also have to consider temporal changes. So these are extreme um, heat waves basically that I'm talking about. So 
climate change, as well as being associated with an increased mean temperature, we see more frequent heat wave events. And a good example currently is a very severe heat wave that's occurring in India. So if you can see from the diagram here, even a small increase in mean temperature leads to uh, a shift uh, in the extremes. So ways you used to see kind of um, rare record breaking temperatures. Uh, nowadays, we see this much more frequently. And it's very clearly demonstrated by data. So if we look from the 1950s to the present day, you can see how the distribution of temperature has uh, shifted. And currently we see around 22% of the days being classed in this sort of dark red region, which uh, back in the 50s to 80s was uh, almost never occurred. So we have to take into account these, these extremes. And one example is the summer of 2003 in Europe. So this was, although it's quite a long time ago, it was a, a really severe heat wave and it's extremely well studied. We use it uh, quite often as a, quite a, a, a sort of example of an, an event that really affected health across Europe. And you can see from this satellite image that France and Germany were the, the regions that had uh, the most, most severe temperatures. And it had a really uh, severe impact on mortality in August 2003. And this example shows you uh, the grey lines here show you 20, uh, 19 years of uh, mortality data. So for every year, there's the daily mortality plotted on, on this graph on top of each other. And you can see in red, this is the mortality, the daily mortality that was associated with the COVID outbreak in 2020. So you can see obviously mortality rose in this uh, in the spring of 2020. But if you look in the background, you can see this very large spike in mortality that was associated with the, um, the heat wave in 2003. And you can see that the counts of daily mortality reached around three and a half thousand. And this caused great uh, problems in, in France. Uh, the infrastructure, the, the health system really couldn't cope with such a severe impact. And it's thought that this heat wave was responsible for up to 70,000 people dying across the whole of Europe. And one of the outcomes of this severe impact uh, of this heat wave is that many countries now have employed heat health warning systems. So including France and England, we now have heat wave plans basically, which, uh, which allow the government to better prepare for events like this in future, because we know that they are becoming more and more frequent. So it's possible to, so we, we can clearly see that uh, temperatures has, has an effect on mortality and it's possible to derive uh, temperature mortality relationships. So here's an example. Uh, the graph here shows the relative risk on the y-axis, which is the relative risk of mortality from heat. So 1.2 represents a 20% increase risk of mortality. And you can see if you plot this against the distribution of temperature, you can see that it rises as uh, temperature rises and the risk gets uh, increasingly high on very uh, warm days. And obviously if we see a shift in uh, temperature towards the right, we, uh, we can expect more mortality in the future from heat. <clears throat> and it's possible to derive relationships like this for any population where you have enough data, you need very long time series of temperature and mortality data on a daily basis. And so here's some more examples for uh, European cities and every relationship is slightly different and that will depend on the local climate, the population, the type of housing, all of these factors uh, all feed in. And this um, refers back to the, the original diagram I showed that everyone is affected differently by heat and, and by cold. So here I'm gonna give you an example of a study which used a really large data set, so 450 
locations around the world and you can see all of the uh, locations there. So it was really unusual in the scale. Although you can clearly see that there are lots of parts of the world which are currently still under uh, studied and that's because we just don't have uh, that much data for these regions. Although that is getting uh, a little bit better as more uh, research projects are set up and this, this uh, kind of data is recorded more frequently. So this was uh, to look at global estimates of heat and cold mortality in each of these locations. And just to show you the results now, they're broken down into nine different regions. So you can see uh, for each of the nine panels represents a different region. And then within each region, you have three different emission scenarios. We go from a, a low emission scenario, RCP 2.6 on the left, to the higher one on the right, the 8.5. And then the blue line shows the change, expected change in cold related mortality. And the red line shows the expected change in heat related mortality in future decades. So the general outcome from this research is that we can expect increases in temperature related mortality. We take into account both heat and cold, but there are very clearly important regional differences. And we find that warmer regions, regions that are already warm, so Southeast Asia, for example, South America, are likely to experience quite sharp increases in heat related mortality in the future. But it's also worth pointing out that most of these impacts could be avoided by active mitigation strategies. And that's partially reflected in the use of different RCPs here. And one thing to note is that this study was based on five different global climate models, which had a resolution of around 55 kilometers. That's the temperature data. So that means that local effects like the urban heat island, which I'll talk more about in a minute, they weren't included really in this estimate. That means that we might be underestimating some of the heat effects. <clears throat> and this research also assumed that there were no changes in the population from the current decade to the, into the future decades. And also that the population didn't adapt to temperatures in the future. And although that might seem like quite large assumptions, it's quite standard practice in these kind of studies. And it does mean that we can more easily isolate just simply the effect of climate change, as well as all of the more complicated demographic changes as well. So moving on to a study that we did, uh, basically it was a similar study, but uh, more focused on, on the UK. We used a different type of climate projection. So this was from the UK Climate Impacts Programme that is a specific set of climate projections from the UK government. That is at slightly higher resolution, it's about 25 kilometre resolution this time. And just to take you through this, so as we have seen, temperature related mortality is expected to increase in many parts of the world, in including the UK. And in the UK, what we found was that heat impacts are expected to increase sharply, particularly for older age groups. So the diagrams here show on the left the expected change in heat deaths over the coming decades, and on the right, the change in cold deaths over the same time period out to the 2080s. And you can see that on the left, you, you've got this much more sharp increase in heat deaths that's not matched by a decrease in cold deaths. Um, but it's also worth noting that the heat deaths in the UK currently are around 2000 a year and cold deaths are around 40,000 a year. So we have a much larger cold effect. <clears throat> However, if we look to future decades, this balance shifts and the heat effect becomes much more, uh, much more noticeable in the UK. And one of the reasons that we don't expect such a fall in cold related mortality, despite an increase in temperatures, is that in this study, we do take into, effect, into account changes in the population. And we find that in the future, we have a much larger population in the UK and it will be more elderly. And that means that more people are vulnerable to these risks from heat and cold. And as I say, this analysis was based 
on data which was at about 25 kilometer resolution which is slightly higher than the previous uh, study because we're focusing on on a smaller area so at the time when we published this work i was currently at the time i was working for public health england which is the uk health agency similar to the cdc in china so we had to think about public health messages from from this work and, and they were quite complex messages, in fact, because we're dealing with heat and with cold. So what we what we said basically was in the UK that we know that cold deaths outnumber heat deaths. And that's going to be true in the future as well as currently. We know that the effects of climate change on temperature related mortality in the future are worse for older age groups than younger people. We are likely to see these sharp increases in heat related mortality but not really to see a dramatic decrease in cold mortality. And the public health implication from this work is that cold will continue to be a problem, but particularly with our aging population. So we can't forget about cold mortality, which is a real problem in the UK, particularly with uh, rising fuel costs where elderly people can't afford in lots of cases to put the heating on. However, we do need to increase our attention to heat related impacts. And that's something that typically in the UK, we're not particularly um, adapted to. So our housing, for instance, is more designed to try and keep uh, warm in the winter rather than cooler in the summer. So now we're gonna talk about the urban heat island because I've mentioned it briefly uh, and mainly in the fact that we haven't captured it entirely in the, the studies that I have just presented. So this figure here shows the temperature across uh, Vancouver. So it's a transect across Vancouver. So it's about 50 kilometers uh, wide. And you can see the, uh, the different kind of environments across Vancouver. You've got uh, built up areas, and then you've got some parks and some flat areas with sparse uh, building types as well. And this is to demonstrate the, the urban heat island effect and, and the fact that local climate is very strongly affected by the presence of urban areas and that leads to the formation of urban heat islands. <clears throat> and in fact, you can see the uh, temperature distribution at the, the upper part of the graph. So the temperature is highest in the areas where you see these buildings and then it falls the lowest in the middle where we've got mostly green space. And the, you can see a number of um, references local to LCZ. So we've got local climate zones here. So mainly local climate zone one, it represents a built up area. Local climate zone six is uh, less built up. And then we have things like local climate zone D, which is more about uh, rural kind of uh, landscapes. And I'll move on to what local climate zones refer to a little bit more, but you can quite clearly see the difference in temperature across the city here. And when we use global climate models, we're not really capturing these temperature differences. And we're also interested in urban areas because uh, the urban populations are particularly vulnerable. Over half of the world live in urban areas. And in fact, in the UK, we have a really high percentage urban last census it was estimated at 82 percent and i expect it to increase for the more recent census in many parts of the world populations are growing and aging urban areas are expanding and climate models uh, don't generally capture the urban heat island if they're very coarse so on the right at the bottom you can see the 25 kilometer resolution model that we use for our UK study and you can't really see the presence of urban areas and then if you get close to one kilometer across London you can then really see the, the contrast in temperature and you can even pick out the cooler spots that represent the parks in in London. So there are many problems with overheating in cities we know that urban areas are already hotter than a global average temperature. So when we get heat waves, this could potentially be a real issue. There are impacts on health, but also on reduced productivity. People who work outdoors are particularly exposed, but even people who are working indoors in buildings that are not, um, that are not cooled, uh, that, that 
has uh, really severe impacts on the e economy. There are impacts on power systems, particularly when there's an increased demand for air conditioning. This leads to domestic costs for space cooling, and also not everyone can afford space cooling, so this leads to inequalities. It can also lead to air quality problems. One, one way just that the uh, urban heat island effect can, uh, it can uh, interact with air pollution and trap uh, poor air quality uh, areas uh, close to the, the ground, but also there's the waste uh, heat and the waste um, air pollution from, from um, air conditioning units. There are also water quality problems in, in urban areas when uh, for runoff into drainage. And of course, economic costs from just increased power capacity, things like hospitals need to be kept cool, and this has uh, really big demands on power. And these impacts are not evenly distributed. So impoverished districts tend to be worst affected. Outdoor workers and immigrant populations are more likely to suffer health impacts than the average population. And we also see that there's less, uh, less green space where you see poorer populations and uh, poorer populations are associated with higher mortality from heat. And poorer people can often only afford uh, cheaper air conditioning units, which are often inefficient. And that again leads to inequality. So there are a number of ways to address urban cooling, and these differ by different parts of the world. It depends on the local climate, the local housing and many different factors. And uh, I took this uh, diagram from this United Nations Sustainable Cooling Handbook um, for Cities, and it lists lots of really useful uh, case studies for different cities on cooling the city. So basically it's broken down into three kind of areas, a whole system approach, we need to reduce heat at the urban scale, first of all. So this is about reducing the urban heat island. And this can be through uh, urban, urban um, green infrastructure and also changing the design of our buildings. Secondly, we obviously need to reduce cooling needs inside buildings by making our buildings more sustainable and um, more comfortable. Uh, <clears throat> because we, we spend so much time, up to around 90% of time indoors. And then finally, these, um, both of these issues need to be addressed sustainably. Any cooling needs in buildings need to be sustainable to not exacerbate the urban heat island effect or to increase greenhouse gases. And here are a couple of examples of, on the top, this is a kind of conventional city, and then below, this is a more res heat resilient city. And the kind of things that you see in the heat resilient city are fewer cars, the cars that you have may be electric, there's more cycling, there's more active travel. These things have um, a really good impact on health because people are actively traveling. It reduces uh, things like cardiovascular problems. There's less air pollution that affects respiratory problems. There's a lot more green space in the lower figure. There's more shading, which helps people um, to get out of the heat. We have things like green roofs, which, um, which are extremely useful in lots of ways for reducing heat and also improving biodiversity. You have solar panels, reflective roof surfaces, which we call cool roofs and um, lots more public transport and, and so on. So this is the kind of vision of a, a healthier, more resilient city in the future. There are another, other types of things which will, uh, which will bring down heat in cities. So things like district cooling, uh, heat health warning systems, targeted cooling for particular populations. So care homes which are particularly high risk because they have lots of elderly people. Uh, we can also provide refuge spaces. So in London, we have a number of these buildings which are uh, called so that people who can't access 
cool environments can just uh, basically cluster in these uh, cool, cool refuge spaces as well. And I'm going to finish now on some current research examples. So this is work that we we've done in recent years and that we are uh, continuing to do at the moment. And I will introduce a project that is uh, about halfway through now. And this is funded by the Wellcome Trust. It's called HEROIC, and that stands for Health and Economic Impacts of Reducing Overheating in Cities. And it's led by uh, UCL. Uh, we also have partners in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, University of Exeter and Tampa University. And the, the, the objectives of HEROIC is to employ regional climate modelling of the urban heat island at high resolution, so one kilometre resolution to better characterise the urban heat island. We also want to consider health and economic impacts of heat, and we want to consider vulnerable populations and health inequalities. We want to increase our understanding of the potential unintended consequences of any adaptation measures that we might implement. And we want to consider different cities, different populations and different climate regions. And we focus on both indoor and outdoor temperature exposure. So initially we were focusing on a number of different cities. So London and Birmingham in the UK are the two largest cities. We're also considering East African cities and that's because we have a partner project, which is the Kush project, which Mike Davies will talk about next week, um, which has cities like Nairobi and Kisumu. We're also looking at uh, Sao Paulo and Delhi as well. And there are three main work packages. So it's about modeling the urban environment. And then the second work package is about quantifying the health impacts of heat. And finally, looking at interventions and assessing health and also health economic impacts. And the health economics part is, is led more by the University of Exeter. So this is an example of the kind of modelling that we're doing to, uh, to capture the urban heat island effect using climate modelling. So this is actually a previous work that we published in the last few years. So this is an example of the West Midlands research. So this is the middle of the UK. It's the second largest city in the UK and it's really heavily urbanised region. So what we've been doing is modelling using a climate model called WARF, W-R-F, which is the weather research forecasting model. And it's developed at uh, NCAR in the, in the United States and it's a free to use model. We've run it at one kilometer resolution. And for this kind of model run, we used three urban classes. So we, we characterize the urban environment into three, and that is shown in the middle diagram here. So we have industrial areas or commercial areas, which are shown in red. And then we have the high intensity residential areas in yellow, the lower intensity residential areas or suburbia in light blue, and then non-urban areas are shown in dark blue, and then these were further divided up into specific rural areas as well. And then within this one kilometre classification, we have a sub one kilometre uh, kind of scheme, which is a urban boundary layer physics scheme called uh, BEP, which stands for Building Energy Parameterization. And this is a 3D scheme. So what that means is it allows us to imagine that there are buildings in the way which disrupt the airflow. There's vertical uh, turbulence, there's eddies, and there's uh, shading effects as well from the buildings. And another good reason to use this kind of urban scheme is that we can manipulate different parameters within the model and then see what effect that has on the urban heat island. So for example, we can make the buildings taller or shorter or widely spaced, or we can change the materials of the buildings and look at what the impact is on the local climate. So from this modeling, uh, we, we modeled the urban heat island across this region. So that's shown on the right there. 
And we found that the urban heat island intensity, so the difference in temperature between urban and rural was up to about 10 degrees different, which is obviously a really huge, um, huge increment in temperature. And from this modeling, we were able to apply a health impact assessment. And we found that the urban heat island, we estimated that it's responsible for 40 to 50 percent of heat related mortality, which was obviously uh, a really significant uh, amount. I mentioned that we, we want to look at interventions to reduce this kind of heating. And by ma manipulating the parameters in the model, we were able to look at the effect of cool roofs. So these are shown in this diagram here. It's simply a matter of changing the reflectivity or the albedo of roof surfaces to make them more reflective and that uh, reflects sunlight and then in theory should keep the, the local temperature lower. So at this stage we're looking at outdoor temperatures remember but we also have models which will uh, look at the indoor temperature as a result of putting on cool roofs. So what we found in this study was that cool roofs were quite effective at reducing maximum daytime temperature particularly on commercial buildings and they were able to reduce the predicted heat mortality, this 50% that we previously found, by up to a quarter. I mentioned that we wanted to check that we don't run into unintended consequences of, um, of any interventions that we might make. So what we did was we ran the model in, as well as the summer season, also ran it in winter. And we found that the urban heat island in general is protective for health during winter because it means that cities don't get so cold and that we can offset around 15% of cold mortality in this case. But importantly, the cool roofs, when they were kept all year round, we found that they don't have such a big uh, impact in winter because there's less incoming solar radiation and therefore cool, cool roofs are not detrimental. Uh, we don't get this kind of penalty in the winter, which is potentially good news because cool roofs are, are very cheap and could be very effective at reducing local urban heat island effects. We also did some spatial analysis and found that housing types that are prone to overheating, like apartment buildings, tend to be located in the warmest parts of the, the city. You can see it underneath, we've got uh, highest temperatures, also high uh, population density, and but also you can see on the right at the bottom, the deprivation is highest in these areas. And if you plot simply increasing deprivation against urban heat island intensity, you can see a uh, quite clear relationship here. So the study I've just described had three different urban categories, but I think we're all aware that there are many more urban categories than simply three. Here's some examples here. So we wanted to take into account more heterogeneity across the, the city. Uh, and by, doing, by, by uh, increasing the number of urban land use classes, this is how we address this. And we employed the local climate zone system. So on the right, you can see examples of the local climate zone system. We've got local climate zone one, which is mainly very built up and high rise, and then going through to all the different um, suburban and, and lower intensity kind of um, built up areas. So rather than have three urban classes, we now have uh, 10, and we also have different rural classifications. So what we've started doing at in London now, so this is work that's led by Oscar Bruce. He's running the wharf model again, but now using uh, up to 10 urban classes, and at, again at one kilometer resolution. So the figure on the left shows London, that's the center of London and the southeast of England, and the colours represent the different local climate zones. All the, the black dots there represent citizen weather stations, which are um, a really large data source, but not that well uh, quality controlled. So Oscar has also been doing some work using the citizen weather station data and removing bad data and basically using it to our advantage. So 
Again, Oscar's using the BEP scheme, the Building Energy Parameterization Scheme. And from this, we're able to model the urban heat island across London. So you can see on the bottom left, this is the urban heat island effect for July 2018, where we had a um, bit of a heat wave. And then also he's been manipulating the cool roofs. So we've got the impact of cool roofs and also the impact of green roofs on, um, on London temperatures. So the local climate zone system, one of the advantages of it is that it's a universal system. It can be applied any, anywhere in the world. And the idea is to make urban climate modeling a little bit more accessible and comparable. So for example, yeah, there's also lots of work currently in Africa. So Africa, as you're probably aware, is, is quite understudied. Um, local climate zones hadn't been classified in, in much of Africa uh, until recently. So this is a project that's ongoing. So we can apply local climate zones for places like Kampala. You can see that local climate zone seven, which is highlighted in yellow at the bottom, that is um, more of an informal settlement that can, we can use this climate zone classification to highlight. I just want to talk briefly on some work in Sao Paulo. So we, we have a visitor, Sarah, who's visiting us from the University of Sao Paulo for six months. And she's been working on heat waves and also cold spells in, um, in the city of Sao Paulo. And her recent work um, has been published here. It shows uh, for various disease outcomes. So you've got cardiovascular disease, heart and respiratory problems, that when you plot the, uh, the duration of the heat wave and look at the relative risks of um, mortality, you get an increased relationship as the heat wave duration increases in length. And, and Sarah is um, visiting uh, for six months and she's going to be looking at the urban heat island effect in Sao Paulo. This hasn't really been studied or modelled um, yet. So we, we're hoping to model the urban heat island in, in Sao Paulo during a specific heat wave event and estimate the, the impact of the urban heat impact, urban heat um, island in, in Sao Paulo. And some of the parts of Sao Paulo in the centre of the, the city have uh, quite rich populations, which is in contrast to places like London and, and Birmingham. So we're very interested to, to look at this data. And luckily, Sarah has access to some really excellent data. We've got lots of meteorological stations and mortality data. We can link that with the socioeconomic index. Some other work that's been led by Charles Simpson in London. He's looking at green roofs. So I mentioned cool roofs. Green roofs are also um, really interesting for us. And the Greater London Authority, the government, is really interested in kind of retrofitting and um, trying to cool down the city of London using things like green roofs. We realise that there's not really an up-to-date public database on green roofs in London. We don't know where they are and what type of buildings they're on. Uh, obviously, we want to know, does it make much difference to urban temperatures? And potentially, we want to say how many more buildings could have these um, cool, uh, green roofs. So Charles has been using machine learning and various data sources to, um, to kind of classify green roofs cross-referencing lots of data sets like LIDAR and aerial imagery, also looking at building data to really look at which types of building currently have these uh, green roofs. And he's able to build up a green roof percentage by area in London. We also have Rebecca Cole, who's a student working with us on, um, on basically the role of different drivers on heat stress and auto inequalities in London. So there are lots of different models to, to do this, including the kind of climate models, the microclimate, the neighbourhood scale um, and the building scale models. So Re Rebecca is kind of synthesising all this data and will be looking at synthetic population and what are the factors that really determine the impacts on um, the urban environment on health.
I'll mention a couple of studies from the University of Exeter. So we have um, Joe Garrett and James Grelia who are working with us on Heroic. They, they have um, some very excellent data from a study called Blue Health, which is a European project. And it was a, a survey based study. It, it had a thousand people per country in 18 different countries. They asked people about visits to natural spaces, basically. Um, and there were questions like, how did you feel when you visited each of these um, environments? But what they hadn't done until recently was uh, look at different weather variables. So what we're doing within Heroic is we're looking at whether how the weather affects people's perception of their recreational visits. So whether they enjoyed it more when it was hot weather, rainy weather or windy weather and, and so on. Another study at Exeter, again, this is about health economics. Um, so James is leading this, looking at an economic valuation of physical activity. So when people visit natural environments, they uh, increase their physical activity. And this has an economic benefit to the, um, the general economy. So basically this study looked at natural environments over about a decade and found that there were an estimated average, uh, annual average of about 5.7 million English adults engaged in around or above 600 metabolic equivalent of task minutes so that's just a measure of physical activity on visits to natural environments each week and then what what James did and colleagues is to uh, translate this into an economic uh, benefit um, based on various health outcomes so we have things like ischemic heart disease stroke diabetes and, and cancers and when we take these visits into consideration, we find that avoiding these, um, these health outcomes results in expected annual savings of approximately 26 million pounds. Uh, if we increased the number of active visits by about 20%, we could further increase this saving by almost 34 million. And James has also started looking at the mental health benefits and depression uh, avoided through these uh, through these natural environment physical activity visits, and we found that the numbers are even even more uh, much higher as well. So there's a lot of public um, mental health benefit from from this kind of uh, visit. And I'm just going to summarise now, uh, just to say that uh, in general, temperature changes are leading to increased mortality in many parts of the world. Particularly, I think large risks are, are going to be in the already warmest regions of the world. In the uh, urban populations are likely to be a high risk of, urban, of overheating. And that's due to the urban heat island effect and the fact that more people um, are moving to cities. We need to explore a range of complex risk factors that I've tried to highlight in order to improve health estimates also to better assess the role of adaptation measures, to reduce multiple risk factors in future, and to more effectively target vulnerable populations against heat. We will need to employ adaptation measures in our cities as well as mitigation, because even if we meet all of our net zero targets, we still have a certain amount of climate change already in the system. So we do need to adapt as well as mitigate. But it is possible that we can achieve health benefits from policies aimed at mitigating climate change. So as well as reducing greenhouse gases by switching to healthier active travel and, and so on, and healthier diets, healthier um, energy production, uh, lower carbon energy production, we reduce um, a lot of environmental hazards, but also improve health. And that's the kind of message that the um, public health practitioners kind of um, try to embrace. So thank you very much for listening and I'll, I'll finish there and I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, thanks Claire. Thanks for your uh, interesting talk. So now, now we move into the uh, QA session. Uh, is there any questions from the, yeah.
I saw a question in the chat. So Clive, can you can you see the question in the chat? So the first one I think is about uh, temperature use, so land temperature, air, and the air temperature. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is a, a quite is a, a good point. Um, so we tend to model uh, air temperature. The the uh, Jonas is talking about land surface temperature, which satellites would measure. You get large contrasts in land land surface temperature, but we measure air temperature. Well, we 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 monitor air temperature and we model air temperature because this is this has a much larger impact on health, basically. So we're very interested in air temperature. So land surface temperatures can be 10 degrees or more hotter than the air, which is true. But what we were modeling was air temperature. So yeah, it, it's important to make that distinction. Yeah, and another question from Duncan. Mm -hmm. well, for city without weather data, are you able to use features to That's understand yeah. yeah yeah so there are lots of cities where we don't have much weather data unfortunately um there are sort of various um <laughs> models like uh land use um land use urban uh land land use regression models so you can basically uh look at if you have enough data on the type of landscape you can um, you can kind of predict what temperature you would have. It's not that accurate always, but if you don't have any data, there is there are methods that you can kind of predict air temperature based on land use, but really there's no substitute for really good data. We do need observations when we look at cities. We try to use models to fill in gaps around observations, but they shouldn't really replace observations totally. Yep. And the next question is from Gavin. So mm -hmm. for warmer summer, is it possible for mosquitoes to be more common in the UK? Yeah, that, that is um, something that we used to work on quite a lot at Public Health England. Um, we Mosquitoes do have uh, this temperature relationship. So there are part, if it's warmer, you're more likely to see mosquitoes. Um, so we, we are uh, aware that um, we do have different species of mosquitoes starting to arrive in the UK. But another important factor is that mosquitoes, uh, they need an environment where they can thrive and um, reproduce. So if you, things like swamps, you know, they're, they're very um, amenable to mosquitoes. We don't tend to have too much of that in the UK. So when we do get um, mosquitoes, they, they don't survive for, for too long. We do see uh, ticks are a problem. We get Lyme disease from ticks um, and we're sort of starting to see that a little bit more. But yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, infectious disease risk is, is something that people are definitely keeping an eye on in the UK. Yeah, and the next question I see uh, Zhou Wang raised up mm -hmm. his hand. So Zhou, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, I will. I will put that in um, in in the. Uh, we haven't written the 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 paper on activity yet. That's still in um, in preparation. But I can put a link to the the Blue Health project, which was the previous project. Yeah, that would be great. So, Joe, so you can unmute yourself. Thank you, thank you, Ray. Hi, Claire. Thank you for sharing so many exciting research. Uh, I have one question about the weather research and the forecast climate model. I'm just curious what kind of model it is. Is, uh, is it a CFD model or heat transfer model? Or have you, do you have any publication or open source this model? Yeah, sorry if I didn't make that very clear. So it, it's um, a regional climate model. So it's uh, an atmospheric model, basically. So it, it's, it's like a, a, a climate model with grids. Um, it, it has many layers through the atmosphere and then um, many uh, uh, horizontal grids as well. You can run it for very large, you can run it globally in fact, but it tends to be used to just focus on, um, on cities. But I, can, I, I will put a link to the, the, the development, the, the main model page in a minute. 
Thank you, Claire. So uh, I'm asking because we are doing a study to analyze the impact of a PV integrated uh, green roof on the uh -huh. urban climate. So I think it's very relevant to what you studied. I, I mean, inspired me a lot. Thank you. Okay. You might want to also look at um, sort of neighborhood scale modeling. So Wharf may be one kilometer, but there's things like EnviMet, which would be a few, a few meters. So that might be useful for you. I see. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, is there any further question for Claire's talk? Okay, so if no further question, and uh, thank you again, Claire, for your uh, excellent talk.